Welcome, everyone, to this episode of Beyond the Crucible. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show and the communications director for Crucible Leadership. And you have clicked play on. We really, 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 really hope you have clicked subscribe to a podcast that talks about what we call crucible experiences. Now, crucible experiences are those things in life. They can be tragedies, traumas, setbacks, failures. What they have in common is that they feel like they knock the wind out of your sails. They feel like they knock the wind out of your lungs. They can and often do change, quite literally, the trajectory of your life. But here's the good news. We don't gather together here virtually to talk about them, to sort of build a campfire and trade war stories about our crucibles. We talk about crucibles with an eye toward offering hope to those who've been through them, that they are indeed not just survivable, but this isn't a word applied correctly, but they're thrivable. You can come out on the other side if you learn the lessons of your crucibles. You can come out on the other side leading what we call a life of significance, a truly um, uh, happy life that is on purpose and dedicated to serving others. Here, as always, is the actual host of the program, the founder of Crucible Leadership, Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, I know you're going to love this episode. Absolutely. Very excited. Uh, and if you're not watching this on YouTube, you didn't see the big smile on Warwick's face, uh, <laughs> listener, when he said he was excited. You probably heard in his voice. And the reason, listener, why Warwick is so excited is that today's guest is Katie Folks, a dual Olympian, a researcher, a consultant, a leader, and executive coach. 15 plus years in senior roles in human capital, I love that phrase, building capability of individuals and teams. Passionate about long-term sustainable performance and resilience. Mom of two young girls, <laughs> happiest when learning. Warwick, take it away. Well, Katie, thanks so much for being here. And as we mentioned, kind of off air, one of the reasons I'm so excited is you've spent a lot of your life uh, rowing at a very elite level. And rowing is always my favorite sport. Uh, growing up, I grew up in Sydney, rowed at uh, Cranbrook School, which is a boys' school, fours, eights. Actually, before fours, we were rowing in what they used to call like tubs, like big heavy clinker boat things that weighed a ton. I don't know how we even got it in the water, you know, sort of you know, little kids putting these big things in the water. Sydney Harbour, no less, which uh, a lot of stories there, which I'll try not to bore everybody with. But um, as you would know, uh, the wake of a, of a Sydney ferry is sort of enormous. So if you go head on into that with a rowing shell, an eight, it could well break it in half. So it's like, you know, quick, you know. Rotate the boat. <laughs> a few jellyfish fights because that's what you do in Sydney Harbour. Um, but so uh, anyway, uh, I rode there. And then when I went to Oxford, I rode in my college, Balliol, which was fun. I'm sure you probably don't experience this, but uh, as a cox in a Oxford college, you actually, your objective is to hit the other boat. You're actually meant to hit them, you know, which you probably have heard of. I mean, not sink them. It's not like a, you know, a Greek trireme, which is going back rowing a, you know, <laughs> couple thousand years. But um, no, you're meant to actually hit them. So anyway, all that's to say, I love rowing. Um, so Katie, um, tell us a bit about what got you into rowing. I mean, I think you mentioned you grew up in Ballarat, but tell us about family background, because not everybody does rowing, you know, no. so it's not like you're on the ocean. I don't know if there's Absolutely. a river near Ballarat, but... So talk about your family and how that all ended up lining up to rowing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and great to be here. And I, and I think we have a, a similar passion. I too love rowing as much as I'm not so involved these days. Um, so they're really, you know, a bit of a, a bit of background. Um, I grew up in mostly in Australia, as you can probably tell by the accent, but also we're, was fortunate enough to live overseas. My dad was a pilot. And he, and you'll see probably here's some similarities as we, as mm -hmm. we talk today, he was really passionate about learning and trying new things. So mm -hmm. where that feeds into it is as I was growing up, dad with his passion for flying and airplanes 
would go to different companies and different organizations to fly different airplanes. So what that meant for, you know, one of the kids is that we moved around the world, which was fantastic. And where all that feeds into rowing is when I was, um, goodness, I must have been about 11 years old, we were living in a country called Brunei. And in those days, I think I was the only person with blonde hair in the country and everyone used to pat my hair. But the long and short of it is I was shipped off to boarding school and I still say I was an angel. They weren't trying to get rid of me. <laughs> so I was shipped off to boarding school to um, a town that you mentioned, Ballarat, which is about an hour or so out of Melbourne in Victoria, Australia. And I was uh, on an academic scholarship there and I am um, naturally height-wise quite petite, so I'm just over five foot. So when I joined this school, the PE teacher, physical ed teacher, came up to me very, very early on in my first few weeks and said, I think we need to get you to the boat shed. So they had a rowing program at the school. And of course I didn't, I didn't even know what this sport was. And the <laughs> reasoning, the reasoning he said to me is you've got two things going for you for this role of a, a cox, a coxswain. And that was, you need to be small, which I was, and, and you need to be smart. And he'd seen the academic scholarship and thought, oh, she could do this. So I, I headed down to my, you know, first session at the boat shed and, and that was it for a couple of years. I was hooked. I was literally thrown in a boat and I can't remember if I was told what to do, but you know, you know what it's like, you get to go out on the water. Here I was in year seven and I got to be in boats with you know, year nine, so you know, 15, 16 year olds. And then as I got older, I sometimes got to talk to the boys when I was in year eight and they <laughs> say hello to me around the school and um, lots of wonderful experiences. So that was my entry into the sport. That, was that a co-ed school or? It was, yeah, it was okay. a co-ed school. Because in, 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 in Australia, at least when I was growing up, a lot of the schools were boys' schools or girls' schools and maybe it's changed a bit, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, so. I think, yeah, very much still in Sydney it's like that. Um, in uh, Outside of Melbourne, the couple of schools in, in this area, I'm back in Ballarat now, uh, there's a number of co-ed schools and the other thing I should mention in there, you mentioned about a lake or a, a river. Yeah, yeah. We just happened to be sitting, our boat club was sitting on a lake. And that huh. lake um, was where the 1956 Olympic rowing event was held. So right through wow. the middle is a proper Olympic rowing So course. that was yeah. where they had the, the Melbourne Olympic rowing. Yeah. Wow. So it was actually uh, all set up for that. Wow. Run down and when I was there, but <laughs> it was a straightish line and good water. So, <laughs> well, who who knew when you think what are your qualifications? Small and smart. I mean, you don't tend to yeah. think as what does that qualify me? I mean, you know, okay. in of itself, you don't think those two things correlate to know. you know a particular line of work. But um, but that yeah. that is uh, boy, that is amazing. So. Uh, and obviously, I'm sure list, most listeners would know, but uh, Cox is the one who steers the boat, directs it, you know, it's almost sort of like a coach, maybe a bit, you know, they tell the Absolutely. crews when to row faster, and hey, we're gaining on them, and you know, all of that, you sort of, so you're not just, you, so you do a lot of coaching and managing and, and leading, really, in a sense. Absolutely. Yeah, I often describe it as being a coach in the boat, and my career post-coxing was initially coaching in rowing and then progressed to more broad coaching conversations. But you, you, your role, and I'd, I'd think about it as I got a little bit better in the role, was that if I was to speak, I either needed to make the boat go faster or maintain boat speed and help the athletes do it more efficiently. Because there's a so, lot of encouragement that goes on and... Um... Yeah, I'm sure you were a smart cox because here's an example that I can remember of one that's uh, wasn't quite at, at your level of uh, motivation. Even let's say in high school, we were racing one time in a regatta, and um, and I, th I think we were in a four, and the cox decided in the middle of the race to tell the crew, "I'm tired." <laughs> you know, as a cox, you never tell your crew who are rowing and you're not 
I'm tired, right? Because we want to th- throttle the guy and throw him in the water yeah. or probably worse. But yes, you, you never tell the crew that you're tired, right? No. Well, I wouldn't even use that word about them. I've heard some people say, I know you're feeling tired. I'm like, oh, that's not really the most inspiring message in there, is it? But, but no, I guess I, maybe it was a strategic trying to make you angry and get some adrenaline in, maybe. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, we were like 14, 15. I don't think he was <laughs> that smart at that point in his life. <laughs> so, no, it was... Um, not a swift move, but I know you've got a lot into resilience. Is there anything about your mom, your dad, just siblings or something that really helped shape who you are, whether it's a, you know, a, a way to spring back from adversity, resilience? Does that come from anything in your background or examples? Oh, I'm, sh- yeah, I'm sure it's come from a lot. I, the, the, the person that um, comes to mind, and if I'm honest, comes to mind on a daily mm-hmm. basis is my dad. Dad and I were, were very, very close. Um, he passed away, oh, my goodness, about 15 years ago now, I think. Mm. Um, but, you know, I grew up hearing these stories of, and, and many of us have these wonderful role models mm-hmm. in life, don't we? But these stories of this man that um, in his day was sort of breaking the boundaries and shaking mm. off the, the shackles, if you like, from what I understand, you know, his his dad, my grandfather, was experienced, he was a prisoner of war, etc. And so, you know, this mm. very difficult life and then became a plumber. And mm. so there was an expectation that my dad, too, would follow in those footsteps and become a plumber. And dad, from what I understand, in his very early teens, rejected this view and ran away to become a pilot and of course if you don't come from or certainly in those days if you mm-hmm. don't come from a family with wealth that can facilitate mm-hmm. that it's a pretty difficult career to get into so i heard stories about him you know influencing people at the local airfield that in return for him mowing the grass they might teach him to fly and all of these wonderful stories And then it wasn't just that, just constantly seeing this man that would be looking for an adventure or asking questions somewhere to find out more about something that really curious and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Just, you know, keen to actually get out there and, and explore and try things out and get better at what he did. So there were many times in life, if I look at through that resilience lens where, you know, I think it was modelled that things could have been a challenge, yet what I saw was someone turn towards them and see them as opportunities to do things differently or try something new. I mean, that's a really a great role model and, you know, not everybody has it, but we're blessed when we do because I'm sure in that era, when your dad was growing up, it's easy to think, okay, plumbing is a good uh, job. You know, I can get you in. You know, we've got contacts. Uh, you know, uh, it's a good it's a good life. It can sustain a family. And how are you going to afford all these fees? And not, nothing against your grandfather, but it would be easy for him to say, look, this is unrealistic. You got to, oh, you know, absolutely. You know, you know, get your head, you know, get your head on, on the ground. Stop with all these pipe dreams that probably won't work you're setting yourself up for failure and and just to have and you can understand that perspective if that's how you've grown up uh but the fact that your dad fought through that i'm sure respected loved his dad but so like i hear what you're saying but respectfully i want to go for it and i think i can make it and did i mean that that takes a lot of courage to go against you know what's what's normal for where you grew up not everybody that goes against that so no. it takes a lot of bravery and courage so yeah that was a it great does. example so mm-hmm. i know you've got a fascinating story so you so you uh, obviously coxed in in high school and then mm-hmm. tell us about what happened after that and then the australian institute of sport came up so what did you go mm-hmm. straight to there or what happened after high school from there to mm-hmm. australian institute of sport Yeah, well, I'll go back a step, actually, because in high school, um, I, by the time I was, so our equivalent of what we call year nine, so I'm about Mm -hmm. 15, so I've still got a few years left of high school, I made the school top boat, Mm. and we won the local 
regatta, the local competition. Mm -hmm. And when I was 15 and growing up in a smaller town, although Warwick, you might know the head of the school boys in Sydney is the equivalent Mm -hmm. of what we had here. It actually feels like it's the biggest event in the world. So Mm -hmm. here I am in my rowing career and we won this race. Mm. And at the ripe age of 15, I retired from rowing because I thought I'd reached the pinnacle of my sport. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, I've done it all. (laughs) And so I did a little bit of coaching at school after that and, you know, did a lot of other activities. And then it was back when I went to university, I went to Melbourne University and went to a college there. And it was kind of expected as part of my, uh, I guess, selection to get into this residential college. I put on my CV that I wrote and yeah. therefore it was expected that you wrote for your college. Right. And so there I was convinced to get back into a boat. Um, and really, really quickly that led me to joining Melbourne University and a number of selectors and state bodies were able to listen to my to what I was doing and I hit the radar of the Australian Institute. So, so you started off with a college at University of Melbourne and then ended up rowing for a crew for the University of Melbourne. Yes. Um, and um, I'm trying to think, uh, I mean, these days uh, in men's rowing, you sometimes have women who are coxes or, or not. I'm trying to remember. It can be... Well, yeah, it's recently changed so you can. So that was a bit of a battle in my day, but I was the exception. Mm. So even at the college, I convinced them that I would cox the men's boat. Right. Um, It was the faster boat. I wanted to go fast. (laughs) 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 Who's going fastest and how do I get in that boat? (laughs) Fair fair enough, fair enough. Um, But obviously at a certain point you felt like, no, I want to be the cox of, of, you know, a women's eight and ultimately Olympics. And you made that, obviously, yeah. I don't know if it was a choice or just the way it worked out. But Yeah, well, it was interesting. So I started getting invited to camps at the mm-hmm. Institute of Sport, which is in a city called Canberra. So I'd fly mm-hmm. up and get to attend these camps. That, that, that's for, for U.S. Uh, listeners. That's the capital of Australia. Yes. So. Yeah. Somewhere in between Sydney and Melbourne, kind of. Yeah, ish, yeah. (laughs) And in those days, this is before the Sydney Olympics, Mm -hmm. to, if you wanted the, I guess, the golden ticket to get to Mm -hmm. the Sydney Olympics in rowing, then the best way to do that was to be at, to be based at the Australian Institute of Sport. And they had one spot there for a female cox. And so there I am going on these camps and then flying back to Melbourne to go to university and keep these various other aspects of life alive. And I was offered this one spot to the AIS to be their cox. And I think I was 22 at the time and I decided to turn it down. Now, at the time, my thinking was that I look back and I think, well, I was coming up against every camp. I was coming up against other coxes Mm -hmm. and I would see them come to a camp and they'd last a few days. And my version of it is they'd be spat out the other side and you'd never see them again. Mm -hmm. So I think at the time, you know, only 22, I had this sense that I wasn't ready. And if I wasn't ready, I'd just be spat out of the system and that'd be it. But you can imagine the head coach's response when this young, his words, Mm. arrogant 22-year-old turns down the the, the V ticket to the Olympics, basically. And uh, and so I was sent back to Melbourne, tail between my legs, and that was it. I think, you know, a lot of people said to me they thought that's they'd never hear of me again in the rowing world. Because they're thinking... Go ahead. In the, the... The vernacular of beyond the crucible, that's your crucible moment, that moment mm. right there. Mm-hmm. You're invited, right? You're invited to be on the team and you mm. say, I don't know that I'm ready. And they don't care why you're not ready. They just sort of put a label on you. And mm. um, you go back, as you said, with your tail between your legs. That mm. was, uh, you realize perhaps later, that was a crucible moment for you. Mm. How did you handle that? Because, mm. um, uh, your career obviously didn't end there. So you no. handled it in a very proactive way, I think. I did, I did. So I had a couple of months where I focused on my university and I think 
you know, was telling myself this story that, oh, it's fine, I'll find some interesting career whilst I'm studying mm -hmm. statistics at university type of thing. Um, and it was a couple of months later, I had this real uh, physical, I remember this physical response that it's time, I'm ready and I want that spot. So it was a really short time frame. And I rang the head coach up at the Australian Institute of Sport and I don't remember what I said. I have this vision of saying, da da, you know, have you waited? I'm here. <laughs> I don't think it was like that, but yeah, ready? Have you, have you exactly. waited? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And not surprisingly, he had no interest. <laughs> so being told no at that point. So the previous one was my choice. This time, right. someone else was saying no. So my response then, I knew that the national championships were coming up, the rowing nationals. I knew that the Australian Institute of Sport women in their eight were going to be pretty much the Australian team. And I also knew that they had never been beaten at the nationals. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I'll just put a boat together and beat them. And so I literally cold called these names of these women in Victoria, my state, Mm -hmm. and um, introducing myself. Most of them didn't know who I was. Uh, and it turned out that a number of us had a common interest, and that was to beat that crew. And so I was <laughs> really, really lucky that I was able to pull together this fabulous women's eight mixed abilities, but some straight off the Atlanta Olympics, others up and coming. Most had felt frustrated, even burnt by the AIS, the Australian Institute of Sport at one mm -hmm. time. So there was this desire to beat them. And I, uh, you know, bribed my way or influenced my way into borrowing a boat from a school and borrowing oars and begging my parents for the plane ticket to get to the nationals to race. Anyway, long story cut short, we got there. We didn't have a training row. We jumped in the boat on the day to race them and you know rowed up to what we call the starting blocks so the start line uh -huh. yeah really windy day really crazy windy day huh. and when you're in rowing as you would know Warwick, you need yeah. to back your boat into the starting line right and the australian institute of sport boat were up to their third attempt and they just were not backing it in yeah and i arrogantly zipped up there based on my years of rowing in windy yeah. ballarat and zipped it into the starting pontoon so we already had eyes on us uh -huh. <laughs> and then through, you know came flying out and and in the end we beat that crew by about 12 seconds which in rowing which the world is is a lot i mean how lengths. many what, what does that translate into boat lengths about four lengths of a, a women's eight yeah four so lengths i mean that that's yeah. like a that's a colossal mm. win that's like Absolutely. uh that's, you know, I don't know what that would be in football, Gary, and it would be like 30 nothing or something. It would be, it'd be a big score. <laughs> so. I could tell by the look on your face, Warwick, that it was quite astonishing. So Yeah, I mean, four <laughs> boat lengths is, uh, wow. I mean, that's, that's sort of astonishing. I wonder if part of you was channeling your dad. It's like, oh, you know, so I, I can't do this, can't be a pilot. I don't have any yeah. money. I can't, well, I'll, you know, beg, borrow, you know, kind of barter. You know, yeah. kind of, I don't know, genetic Absolutely. influence or yourself combination. It's, um, yeah, that, that is, that is stunning. Beat the system, bit of fun. Well, right. Who, who doesn't want yeah. to? So, you know, who, who are you? Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, but so as you look back, it's kind of interesting. There was a time in which you didn't row at the end of high school, maybe beginning of college. Do you think in hindsight that was helpful? that you just had it because some people can get burned out. I mean, you would know, obviously, um, I think of Ash Barty, you know, I think she's, and it was anyway, you know, number one women's tennis player. And she got burned out playing uh, tennis. And then a few years ago, she just stopped and played, you know, women's cricket at a you know, fairly mm -hmm. elite level. And then she found a love of the, of the game and is back and is doing phenomenally. But you think there was a sense where you just wanted a break or I don't know? Yeah, I think so. And I think... Again, if I, I look at that modeling of, of my dad, you know, as much as he loved being a pilot and he loved aeroplanes, he had so many other hobbies and, mm -hmm. and interests. And so, you know, these days I'm more strategic about that. In those right. days, I think I 
I, uh, I listened a bit more to my intuition. And mm-hmm. so I certainly had those few years off in my later school years. But even between the two Olympics that I went to, so I went to the Sydney Olympics, mm-hmm. then I walked away from the program again. It's like I just needed to repeat this whole, mm-hmm. you know, be named arrogant. <laughs> uh, and I went over to the, Nether- the Netherlands for a year and a half and coached yeah. rowing over there and then oh. came back onto the system. And even then people were telling me, what are you doing? You've got the top spot. Why would you walk away? Yeah. And I had this intuitive feeling that I needed to grow. I needed to do more. And I wasn't going to get the learning that I needed in the one space. Right. And hence you, you just follow. So there's a real lesson, mm-hmm. I think, for people is don't ignore that gut instinct that says, mm-hmm. you know what, I think I need to do this. I know, obviously, you got to make sure it's your gut instinct, not some strange voice but when you Absolutely. i think you know when it's really you and not channeling some other negative vibe or thought but just you know trust your gut if you deep down you feel like you know what katie i i, I need to do something else you listen to that right mm, absolutely and do you know i know now that i'm a bit older I, mm. I find it harder to do now because of course there's there's more responsibilities now and it's but i think in those days I did trust it more and I also acknowledge I was really fortunate that I had those choices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had backup plans, which a lot of people would potentially dream of. I had a backup plan of going back to a good university and continuing Mm -hmm. a degree. So I was in a fortunate position to to have those kind of choices. It wasn't just jump off a bridge without um, without thinking but I, I want to go back to just some of those mm-hmm. that first crucible because um it's not easy for somebody thinking of you at 22 as being arrogant and how could you possibly say no do you look back and say gosh was that was i just scared or was i just was i wise or was mm-hmm. i was i really not ready do you kind of look back and say well it all worked out but was that the right decision or i don't know as you look back how do you assess yeah. that first decision not to you know, be part of the program. Yeah, it's really interesting that I, that I now, 20 plus years later, I actually think about a few points of that in life quite regularly. And I encourage myself now at times to tap into a bit of that. Um, mm. I mentioned, you know, now about responsibilities, but the other thing I did back then is I had this, um, I think this greater how would I say that? Almost this greater inner confidence Mm -hmm. that there would be options. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, I make a choice. I don't make the Australian team. I'd feel better Mm -hmm. about giving it a really red hot go and not making it. I'd feel pretty good walking away from that if I'd given it a really red hot go. And the same, you know, university, I remember thinking, oh, have I chosen the right degree? Maybe I haven't. I'll, I'll, I'll find something else. So I had this real, whether it was right or wrong, I had this sense of that there were opportunities that I could find. It might not be easy, but I'd find them and I'd find goals that I would, you know, wish to strive for and that that process would make me happy. So an, an, another really important learning point that I think listeners should pay attention to is trust your gut and, and trust the choices. And, you know, you, you, you make a choice. You, you never get to play out the what ifs. As I've certainly had a lot of that with my own whole takeover thing and what if. And if I talk to my family and we, you never get to play out the what ifs. But trust your gut. Trust the choices you make and um, then move on accordingly. You, you don't mm-hmm. spending your life going back and, and, and second guessing. Um, and But, yeah, that when you went back to the Institute of Sport and they said no and forming your own crew, I mean, nobody does that. I, 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 I'm assuming that probably has never happened since that somebody did what you did, right? At least not in Australia, mm-hmm. form their yeah, own crew. I, I mean, I that just takes it's... remarkable courage, confidence, chutzpah, however you want to express it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, I mean, where, where does that come from? Because that's not normal. Mm-hmm what you did and you were what in your 20s then yeah where did that come from yeah I think um you know 
I don't know if I have a direct answer. I mean, I, I do attribute a lot of that to watching dad operate and him, him making choices and and even watching family members disagree with certain choices he made and him still making the choice and it working out from my perspective really well and having a, you know, an enjoyable and great upbringing. Um, so whether it was that, um, I do, you know, I, I have to wonder sometimes whether... And this word can be used quite negatively, mm -hmm. but certainly in that era, that I was much more selfish, um, and and that could be I can instead could use the word driven. Um, yeah. You know, some have positive uh, lenses, others don't. Um, you know, I think about a time when I was in Victoria and I was really frustrated. I was part of a rowing club and they didn't have women's boats going to a certain event and they wouldn't even give me a tryout for the men's boats because I wasn't mm -hmm. male. And, you know, I horrified everyone then because I quit the club and negotiated with the other club down the road that if I joined them, they'd let me jump in the men's boats. Now, I didn't even realise at the time that the impact that that had and all the negative talk that apparently was associated around well, this I mean, girl. I mean, to me, but, it's... <laughs> Do you think some of it maybe, and obviously we are in a different era, some of it could be sure. sexist, you know, if, if men stand up for themselves, it's like, look at that guy, guy's self-confidence, yeah, good on him. But if a woman Absolutely. does that, it's like, oh, you know, she's she's driven, she's just, you know, mm. I know there's probably more colorful words for it, but, mm. you know, um, do you think there was some of that, like if it was a guy, it would have been, you know, good on him, you know, but if it's Absolutely. Katie, it's like, oh, you know. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Know your know your place. You know who are you oh, to? You know. Absolutely. But I mean, but good but for you with not buckling to the system, and there's nothing wrong with being driven. It's one thing if you're driven and mowing over other people and being yeah. successful at other people's expense. That's exploitation. That's not drivenness. Yeah. But I don't yeah. think that's that's. I mean, obviously, I don't know you well, but that's not mm -hmm. you. You're driven, but you're not trying to tread on. You know, it's not. You're not trying to get ahead at the expense of other people. No, and I think this is where the role that I had is maybe, you know, as you're saying that, I'm thinking the role I had is a little bit different too. So sure, it was about me getting to the Olympics, mm -hmm. but a lot of the time, the way I would frame my growth, my learning, my drive was to help the boat go faster. And the mm -hmm. boat contained eight other people plus all the surrounding squads. Right. And so there were times as we're talking where I think, yes, yeah, some of the choices I made were really, really difficult, but I'd often step back and it wasn't about me. If I really felt strongly that, that this was for the good of the boat, which ultimately was for the people, my team, yeah. then I moved forward. It, it was for the, it was, it, it was for the, <laughs> it was for the good of the team. Yeah. So I think you deserve to give credit. So I want to get a bit into what you do now, but before we get there, mm -hmm. You had a second uh, crucible, I think it was, was it the Athens mm. Olympics 2004? So that's, um, that was pretty challenging too. So just help the listeners understand what happened with that one. Yeah, I, I will. And I will say, you know, of course, there were a number of other crucibles in between as, as many of us <laughs> face many challenges. Right. Um, so... You know, and, and I'm sure you'll hear in my voice, this is not a topic I talk about often, but I'm sure. turning towards it now. I feel like I need okay. to talk about, about it. Right. So uh, going into Athens, second Olympics, we had just an amazing, amazing crew. And I'm talking here about sure boat speed, but I'm talking about people mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so what, what the general public would have seen, and it was all over the Australian media, media is they would have seen um, an Australian women's age that I was in competing in the final of the Athens Olympics. They would have seen the Australian eight come flying out of the start and being up there in medal contention until about halfway through the, the race. And then... They would have seen it's much easier to talk from a third party perspective yes. <laughs> they would have seen yes. someone in the boat right. stop rowing and lay down as a result of that and then our boat came um sixth in the final which was the last place in the final because we were rowing for the second half of the race with 
um, I think about six people because one of them was laying down, then others around her couldn't, couldn't row. So that was one thing. This is one part of it is there's mm-hmm. this, you know, many of us eight, ten years towards this race and this, this thing happens and we're trying to get our head around all of that. There's that one piece of this moment. The other piece of this moment, which I had no uh, um, anticipation of, was the media response to this. And our crew were, oh, look, I, 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 I'm going to say front, it felt like front page of every newspaper. I know it was international as well, but from a national perspective, in every state for a number of weeks, hmm. um, dishonest stories, narratives around, you know, the girl that stopped rowing was a bad person to the team are awful people to they're a bad team right through to the Prime Minister of Australia saying that we were un-Australian. I'm not sure why, but we were. I don't know if that's because of the result or because of what the media said we did. Anyway, this really enormous moment in life, which as I talk about it, and I can imagine some of the listeners thinking, Mm -hmm. so what? A race went wrong. And, And it was just a race that went wrong. But the ripple effect of that on so many people was just enormous, including myself. Oh, I can imagine. I mean, and again, you don't need to get into details, but it's not as simple as, oh, there was a physical injury and mm-hmm. it, it wasn't, it wasn't, there wasn't a simple prepackaged explanation that the media yeah. or the prime minister would say, oh, okay, now I understand, now we'll back off. It wasn't mm-hmm. that simple. So that, I mean, when you're spending years trying to, you know, get to the Olympics and you're in the final, which means I guess you probably had to go to the semifinals. There's probably a couple of different rungs to get there. Not only is that horrendous with media, you've probably got, you know, team members, potential conflict there. And again, you don't need to get into those details, but there's all these dynamics, potential internal conflict, vilification by the media without any easy explanation and you don't want to, you don't want to, you know, dob somebody in, as they say in Australia. You don't want to get into the details because that's their story and it's not your story right. to tell. But it, it made it probably. I mean, there's nothing really you could say that would be helpful that you were able to say, right? You're probably in this box. There's no win box where, mm-hmm. this is one event where there's no way to win this event. It would seem, right? The event Absolutely. of public opinion. And, and you've just articulated that so beautifully because for so long, and, and particularly coming from that environment, you know, I've just talked about these other examples where I could make choices or I could plan or I could work harder. It all in some ways felt very controllable. And then all of a sudden, if I speak from my perspective, we're in this situation where as you said, there was no, there was no win. There, there was no guideline on how to manage this. And so there was a point where we were told to say certain things to the media, like that there was a breakage in the boat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in hindsight, would that have been easier? Absolutely. But of course you've got Mm -hmm. the values kicking in. We weren't trained in media. You have this group of women who was, were, very passionate about saying, look, we don't know what we should be saying. In fact, we don't really even want to talk to them. We don't care about that. We want to talk to our families right now. But, 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 but don't, don't, ask us, <laughs> don't ask us to say something that's not true, just because yeah, it might so, help other people, because we have to live with right. that. So we felt really strongly about that as well. And I think the other piece in there that often gets uh, missed uh, when people do still to this day talk about this story is, um, you know, the media caught wind of this particular teammate of ours had had scenarios in the past where she mm. had stopped rowing to varying degrees. Mm. And so this became another thing to, to mm. put out on front covers. The piece of that story that got missed, which I think was the part that I grappled with the most, is no one talked about the fact that we as a team knew that history and still 
in many ways trusted our teammate Mm. because it was more than just whether you were going to row at full capacity from the start to the finish. I mean, there's much, you know, know, I'm I'm going on here. There's much more to a person than that. So ultimately I trusted all of my teammates. And as part of that, I knew that we all came with our strengths and we all came with these areas we were working on. And that was the complexity of working in a team. Um, but yeah, the media never showed any interest. Oh, in that I'm, I'm, I'm sure. And I'd you know, love to hear what you learned from that because it wasn't something you could control. It wasn't, not that it matters, it wasn't quote unquote your fault. I mean, there's not a whole lot you could do at that point. But one of the things we say in Crucible Leadership is, you know, you're not defined by your worst day. You know, mm. I mean, I made a, as listeners would know, and Australian listeners would know, I made a cataclysmic uh, mistake, faded to launch a $2.25 billion dollar takeover that ended a 150-year-old family business that had, you know, City Morning Herald and Age in Melbourne and et cetera. And yes, there probably was a better path. I'm not quite sure what other paths would have been better, but certainly couldn't have been worse than the one I took. Okay, so that was a bad day when I launched the takeover. That was a bad mistake. But you know, am, should I be defined by that one day? Should this uh, poor woman be defined by that one day? And again, we don't need to know any more details than that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, well, I don't think so. Is that mm-hmm. fair? Irrespective of all the reasoning. So, mm-hmm. but people tend to want to define you by, especially in the Olympics. It's that one day in the Olympics. Oh, you lost. Well, you're a swimmer. Mm-hmm. You lost by two tenths or two hundredths of a second or something ridiculous. You lost. You mm-hmm. failed. Okay. Mm-hmm. Sorry. I tried, you know, but anyway. And one of the things that you said, uh, Katie, one of the things that you said when we uh, uh, talked off air uh, was that, and I wrote it down, that you you held on to that narrative for Mm. a bit that that impacted Mm. you that first time. Right. You were like, okay, you don't want me on the uh, on Mm. the team. I'm going to go pull people together and I'm going to beat you. And you did Mm. the second Mm. time a crucible hits that's kind of a big uh, thing. You say you held on to the narrative. Um, what were the, why do you think they were different? Those two yeah. situations were different. Yeah, I think for me, so as I, as I mentioned, there were a number of other crucible moments between the one I've talked about and getting to Athens. And in all of them, I felt like I had a choice. The way I turned up, the way I behaved. So it all felt controllable. The outcome didn't feel controllable, but it was all about me. Where this one felt different is I was aware that things can go wrong on race day. And I had plans for every scenario you could possibly think of, including boat breakages and etc. And so that was my controlling component. I never anticipated the level that it could go wrong. So that was one piece and that that shook me because I, you know, if you talked about Katie and her performance, she, I, I, you know, visualised everything possible. So I was like, oh, wow, I missed something. So there's a bit of that playing out. But I think the other component for me, and Warwick, you just said it, is I could not and still can't work out what the better path would be. Mm Mm-hmm. So every other scenario in life up until that point, and I say this knowing I've had a very fortunate life, I felt like the mistakes I made at times weren't that big a deal because it's like, well, you know, I look back and I should have just done this instead and I can, fa- I can focus on the learning. With this particular scenario, I could not work out what should I have done differently and I goodness, you know, trained as an Olympic athlete to reflect and and look at yourself. And I hammered myself, as I'm sure many of my crewmates did as well, about themselves. Down to the detail, that look I saw that day, that conversation I had, should I have not had it? Should I have had a different one? Should I, you know, everything you could possibly think of. And so I made it all about me because that's the way I operate best. Bring it on me, make the choices, move forward. But for the first time, that didn't work for me. And it became this almost debilitating, 
I don't have the answer. I don't know what my learning is. How can I not know? How can I not know what my learning is? It was like this kind of I needed this um, happy ending. You know, mm. this thing happened, and here's what I would have done differently, and I've lived happily ever after. I had this sense from somewhere, and I couldn't work it out. I mean, I think, you know, some. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I think also. Um, a number of things happened around the same time, which, you know, as we know, we're complex mm -hmm. as, as beings. Right. So I came back from Athens. I found out that my dad, who I've spoken highly of, had terminal cancer. He mm. passed away a couple of months later. So even though they're all very separate events, it sort of got packaged, I think. Well, there was like a, a, a cataclysmic crucible, if you will. Yes. Because it happens, you know, here's your dad dearly loved role model and mm. you know and then this is happening and yeah i mean you can't control cancer no. or you know your dad's no. it's not there's no nothing you could have done to prevent what happened yeah i'm sure you had the best no. of care and Absolutely. and you know sometimes there's a learning there is sometimes things happen and it's not easy to know what would have like in my case i can think of what hap what i did was horrendously stupid but I can th it's hard for me to think of scenarios that would have been better at least in terms of made me happier or more fulfilled that's a lot when I'm a strategic planner by nature so I'm it's yeah. hard for me to think that but in this case yes you could say maybe we could have you know we knew this person's history maybe we could have not and said let's not have that person in the boat probably wasn't your call I'm guessing it would have been somebody higher up but even then it's like I mean how do you know that how can you you know, and, and you, you make the best decision and, you you know, it's not always your fault. There's not always an easy alternative. No, and, and this is the thing. I mean, you know, lots of people, and I'm, no doubt you've experienced the same thing, can give you their simplistic answer. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't simple. I mean, using that example, I've had many people say, you should have just gone to the media and, and got her out of the boat. I'm like, well, hang on. I had 10 years of high performance history that told me that trusting your teammates led to boat speed. So why a couple of months before the Olympics would I just decide to not trust my teammates and go public with it? And also remembering that everyone in that boat, in the lead up, made the boat go as fast as it was going. And it was going really fast. <laughs> so, you know, you, you can't just pull a piece out and expect it all right, just to Because you, you're not going to know the, the future. So you can no. only know what you're going to know. So just as we mm. sort of uh, round this uh, turn, talk a bit about what you do with resilience because I love uh, you talk about team synergy and resilience. Mm. You're doing a lot of research on re what resilience is and what it isn't. So you've really pivoted from rowing to well, team performance, which makes sense. You spent your whole life in team performance. And I think one of the things I believe, we haven't mentioned it yet, but I believe uh, you had a, uh, a pretty amazing career. It said you were ranked uh, number one in Australia for close to 10 years as a cock. So that's, that is pretty amazing. That says you, at least objectively, you were best of the best uh, from yeah. a rowing perspective. and. That whole um, strategy, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's big, a brief, uh, a brief aside. Um, I don't follow Oxford Cambridge sports that much other than rowing in what they call the boat race, which yes. they now, as of the last few years, have men and women on the same course. So more yes. power to both those universities are doing that. And I think it was the men's race. It was raced on Cambridge local waters, which they normally don't do. But it sure seemed like the Cambridge Cox, and you probably follow it more than I'd had it all over the Oxford Cox. I mean, just the strategy, home waters, you know, he mm. came really close to fouling, but not quite. Mm. He pushed the envelope mm. real close. Yeah. But it yeah. seemed like, okay, they won. So clearly the Cox did something right. There's a lot of strategy yeah. there, but I digress. Anyway, yeah. getting back to resilience, um, talk yeah. about how you pivoted from rowing to resilience. And talk about how what you do now and really what your passion is. What, what is your mission with yeah. uh, your research and everything you do in Team Synergy and Resilience? 
Yeah. Well, I think if I'm really honest, my, my passion post rowing was in, in high performing teams. Yet the narrative I held from that experience of Athens, you know, plastered all over the front mm. pages of them not being good teammates is I, I turned away from that a little bit. I hid from that. Mm. Um, even though, as you said, that one, one event doesn't define you, I still let it define me. And so mm. my way around that, um, and, and we're talking now 20 years, 20 plus mm. years later, was firstly, for the first 15 years, just work harder on something else. Don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. Keep, you know, keep moving. <laughs> mm-hmm. To more recently going, oh, I've got these research opportunities. This is really interesting. It's showing me that something like resilience, as an example, we simplify and it, you know, show parallels mm-hmm. to my rowing experience here. We simplify these complex events. We tell someone just to be more resilient. We sometimes point the finger at people and say they're not resilient. And it was all very simple. And as I started doing this research and thinking about my own experiences when I'm resilient to some things, not to others, resilient at some times, not at other times, um, I, you know, I was fortunate enough to work with a, a a gentleman called Dr. Michael Kavanagh at Sydney Uni who had this new definition of resilience, which is really exploring what is in our, and I'm going to use dorky language for a second, what's in our surrounding systems, what's around Mm -hmm. us that helps us be resilient. And so the research is showing that if you have access to the resources you need to meet the challenge you're facing, you'll be more resilient. It's kind of obvious, right? So if I look back, all the other challenges, all my other crucible moments leading into Athens, I had the resources around me. I had a state, Victoria, I could go back to. I could talk to people to find boats and people. And so to meet that challenge, beating a crew, I could find the resources. Post Athens, Every one of my good friends, my teammates, was feeling enormous stress. So I didn't have, well, none of us had, those social connections and resources we may have needed. Well, your, your, your crewmates, they were in the same crucible you were. You know? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. You know, they're, they're not really resources because they're, they're in there with you. Absolutely. You know? Our family and friends were also, you know, dealing with this. So we didn't have them that we could access. And at uh, that point in life, oh, sorry, Gary. I was just going to say, I want to make sure the listeners hear what you just mm. described and, and, and pull those balloon strings together here. Mm. We think so often that resilience is just personal, mm-hmm. right? It's we have it in us or we don't. We develop it or mm. we don't. Um, mm. What you're describing is is a more full-throated kind of resilience and that's not just from your experience but also from your research the idea is you do indeed have to dig deeper but that's not all of it you also have to cast wider you have to cast your net wider for those Mm -hmm. assets and relationships that can help you through it so it's not just about Mm -hmm. your quote unquote uh, resilience it's about the Mm -hmm. resilience you can muster through reaching out and drawing on the strength of others True. Absolutely. Absolutely. Beautifully said. And the other piece in there, if you don't mind me adding another layer. Oh, please. Is when we are using resources for a challenge, as we have know from particularly the last few years, mm. we often are not facing one challenge at one time. So then we try and use the same bucket of resources on all of our challenges and it's finite. So we have to keep going wider all make choices. I'm okay to not be resilient on that challenge because I'm going to focus on this challenge. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, so it, what, you, be, what, you, yeah. what you're saying is pick your battles, you know? Absolutely. You, you don't have Absolutely. to be resilient in every area. Like, you know, I've got a book coming out later this year and it's been a culmination of years and I have a great team. Uh, but there are other areas where I don't know. I don't go bungee jumping or ropes courses, and I've never been particularly physically brave. But you know what? That's not a challenge I 
choose to overcome, at least not in my stage of life. And, you know, if, if I wanted to, then I am have a pretty uh, high level of perseverance. I'd probably figure out a way. But, you know, you don't have to face every fear, you know, mm. if you choose not to. I mean, it's like it's, that's not being scared. It's being making choices. Where do you Absolutely. want to be resilient? And, you know, you can't, it's not wise to say, okay, I'm going to tackle 15 massive challenges at once. Well, you probably will fail because who can do that? But, you know, pick, pick your battles, right? Where do you want to be resilient? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And the thing is, you know, when we talk about it, it just, if we have lots of expressions around this, right? So it's kind of common sense. But I think about myself. I think about a lot of the clients I work with. Um, and I am thinking about a number of them right now. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of the women mm -hmm. I'm working with at the moment through mm -hmm. some co executive coaching work. They're very smart women, and we and they know this in principle. Yet in day to day, they're trying to face the challenge of raising children, building a career, navigating that particular project, buying a house, wanting the garden clean, putting on the best party. Do you know? And, and I could hold the mirror up and say the same about me. So, <laughs> do you know? We know it in principle. But I just, I don't see sometimes, including myself, that we are particularly deliberate about it, deliberate about going wide for all of those resources and engaging them for when we need them and engaging things we don't even know we need yet and kind of holding on to them to be ready, nor about making those choices when we have those choices to make. Now, this is a perfect time, and normally what I say is the captain has turned on the fasten seatbelt sign. It's mm -hmm. getting to the point we have to land the plane. I was going to think of some kind of thing I thought was clever about bringing boats into dock, but I know with you guys so <laughs> not only experts in rowing, but, for, you know, but an Olympian in rowing, I was going to make that a terrible analogy, so I'm just going to stick with the the captain turned on the fastened seatbelt sign, and we're getting to the point where we're going to uh, put the plane on the ground soon. But Katie, before we do that, I would be remiss if I did not give you the chance to let listeners know how they can find out more about you and the services that you offer to folks to help them build teams, um, live high performance lives, and uh, engage with their and their community's resilience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the best way to find me is, is probably through my website and it's www.alloneworldkatiefolks. Do you want me to spell it or will it be yeah. somewhere? Yeah. Yes, so please. K-A-T-I-E-F for Fred, O-U-L-K-E-S for Sam, dot org. And always open to have conversations. Love dialogue. Awesome. Warwick, la the last question or questions, your decision are, is are yours. <laughs> wow. I mean, this is such a fascinating story. Just your crucibles are so different, but it sounds like you've learned so much. And one of the things I love about what you're saying is, yes, I think, like, you know, I'm somebody that I'd say has high perseverance. So um I'm not somebody that tends to quit once I start something, so I'm, I, I get where you're coming from. But yet, you're right. I think understanding we need to have resources, but the, the resources that we'll need may be different depending on the challenge. It's not the same team, you know, if it's a different sport, different challenge. So, I mean, maybe this shouldn't be the last question, but I guess one of the things I'm curious about, knowing what you know now, I mean, would you, can you think of what team you would have assembled to help you get through the post Athens Olympics? I don't think, objectively, I don't think there's anything you could have done once it happened. I mean, you can't know what would have happened. You've got to trust your teammates. Totally makes sense. But in terms of how you handle with the aftermath, is there something, gosh, what would have helped me get through that, you know, yeah. from a resilience you know, that's, perspective? That's a really good question. And, it depends how wide we want to go. I mean, <laughs> if we start with a couple of things, I think, you know, it's so easy that these things are seen as a ticker box, like bring a psychologist mm -hmm. in. Tick. Right. But really right. the resources needed, absolutely with some professional skills, but mm -hmm. also that space, you know, a way to bring us together where there's media not around, 
to feel supported, even if it was just to sit with each other and just be in that space, then of course there would be resources like, whether it's counsellors, psychologists, people that care about us. Um, and then you can go more broadly as we as we go to helping helping people. I mean, it's, it's a whole other issue of those that have been in high-performance environments. How do they transition into the normal world? And that's challenging enough, never mind when it's been as high profile. So resources that support in that space. Well, I'm, I'm sure there's a whole other discussion, but post-Olympians, yeah. You know, it's a challenge. You yeah. know, I mean, Michael Phelps, I think, has been pretty open yeah. about his mental health yeah. challenges. And, you know, it's really, you know, it's a different subject. But, yeah, I know, I think in, in my case, um, it took years, decades, to get over the fact that I ended a 150-year-old media dynasty that, you know, has, you know, pretty prominent in Australia. And what could I have done differently? And now what am I going to do with my life? And, you know, sometimes getting through a crucible experience, it takes more than months, more than a year or two. It can take years. And maybe there would have been things I could have done to bounce back quicker. But sometimes it just takes time. Sometimes there's no easy road back. And you just got to, you know, in hindsight, give yourself a break. And you know, you're an Olympian. You could say Olympians should have Olympic recoveries, right? Yeah. It should just take okay. a week, right? Because that's what Olympians yeah. do. But you're human. You know, mm. and sometimes yeah. the feelings and emotions, it can take time, if not years. And that's mm. that's not failure. That's just mm. reality. We're human. Right. So maybe just giving yourself a break a bit. Maybe that would Absolutely. be something. And you probably have had that self-talk over the years. Right. It's like, look, I, I'm doing yeah. my best. I did my best. Quit beating myself up. You've probably had those Absolutely. internal dialogues over the years, I'm guessing. Yeah tell myself to shake it off. <laughs> the other the other component that's come out in the research, because I did interview a number of Olympians last year with this research on resilience, was talking to people that understood. So Warwick, I don't know if it was the mm. same for you, but a lot of uh, people that I speak to that maybe want to ask some questions and they haven't competed at an Olympic level or equivalent right. in sport or life, you know, they kind of go, well, you know, so along the lines of, I don't know why you'd be bothered. I mean, you got you got to do that. That's great. You're lucky. You got to do it. <laughs> and of course, of course, there's a piece in there. Of course, we're very fortunate. So, you know, being around the right people that can, can understand, understand. And empathize. Like you've, you've spent yeah. your whole life trying to reach a goal. It's a mm. big deal. So... Mm. As, as we close here, you know, there's a lot of folks listening. Not many of them will have been uh, rowers or Olympic rowers, but they've been through crucibles. And, you know, resilience seems like a, a pipe dream. You know, they're just tough to get out of bed every day. What would be a word of hope that you would give people that are, that are struggling uh, now? Yeah. You know, um, what's a word of hope, would you say? Yeah, I think um, the word that comes to mind is connection. And this is where I am drawing on my research as well as my experience. But I really encourage, even if you use the word looking through my lens of resources, but social connection, it's it's um, almost like a, um, a vaccination, dare I use that word, for, for negative mental health. And so if you can connect with people, and even if it's a Zoom coffee or a walk, if you can, be with others, and I, that will help you connect with yourself as well. Mm. well I have been in the communications business long enough to know and the last word has been spoken and spoken eloquently mm. and hopefully on a subject. And Katie just spoke that word. Um, before we go, though, uh, listener, we do, uh, Warwick and I have a favor to ask you if you would, if you've enjoyed this conversation with Katie Folks, uh, if you enjoy Beyond the Crucible uh, each week, we would ask that you um, give us a review on uh, the app on which you're listening to it right now. We'd ask that you'd subscribe on the app you're listening to it on now because that's your best way of making sure you don't miss further guests who can offer such uh, both great experience and great perspective on what it takes to move beyond your crucible as the show is about. Uh, speaking of that, in this episode, there's kind of two takeaways I've pulled um, uh, spending 
uh, time uh, really nicely kind of getting to listen to Warwick and Katie having this discussion. And the first takeaway is this, and Katie's life uh, and her experiences in, in Crucibles proves this, a pause is okay. Sometimes it's even critical. Katie put a pin in her pursuit of her goals on several occasions and kept the belief that she would find other opportunities to put her skills and her dreams to work. When those turned up, she pursued them with energy and excellence, with vigor. When she turned again to look forward, she did not look back. And the second takeaway, I think, uh, is on the subject of resilience. And that's this. Resilience is not only an internal strength. It's also an external one. Like rowing, resilience is not a solo sport. Yes, there's some degree of digging deeper, but there's also a great element of casting wider. As Katie put it so well at the end of our discussion, you must focus on connecting with others and with yourself. So, listeners, until the next time we're together, please remember that your crucible experiences are indeed painful. They are traumatic. They do indeed change the trajectory of your life. But here's the good news. They're not the end of your story. In fact, if you learn the lessons of those crucibles, if you apply the lessons of those crucibles, if you respond in resilience, both what you have inside you and what you can draw from others, if you do that, your crucible can be the jumping off point to the next chapter of your life, which can be the most rewarding chapter of your life. How is that possible? Because where it leads, the period at the end of the sentence of that next chapter that you're going to write, the last period in that chapter, leads you to a life of significance. Mm -hmm.